בשם השם נעשה ונצליח. שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים to uh, all the uh, old faces, new faces, ברוך השם. Uh, we're continuing our series, Ikvita de Meshicha, the uh, era of Mashiach, based on Rav Wasserman, Rav Shalom's Sefer, which uh, you can go to our website, Be'ezrat Hashem.org, B-E-E-Z-R-A-T-H-A-S-H-E-M.org, and uh, download for free on the e-book section. I uh, highly recommend to study the book. Study the book, not just read it. Uh, and that really goes with uh, all, uh, all Divrei Torah. It's uh, to read something is what you do with secular things. You know, you read a science book, you read a, uh, I don't know, a philosophy book, you read a uh, non-fiction or fiction or a bio of some kind. But when you learn Torah, you have to study it. And there's a very big difference between the two. Because sometimes uh, to understand the point, you have to read it five, six, seven times uh, in order to really truly get it. Uh, so studying Torah, it's not a race. You know, sometimes we uh, catch ourselves speeding up just so we could say we finished another book but in reality you're missing out the point so study this book study other books it uh, takes more time but you'll get a lot more out of it um, and with that uh, you'll, you'll build yourself up anyway uh, tonight's you will be for a um, רפואה שלמה for רבנית שרה בת ענת, רב אפרים בן שולמית, רבנית לבנה בת שרה, דוריץ' בת ג'ורה, דוד בן נסריה, יתרו בן אברהם, טליה בת שרה, ג'ונס בן שרי היילי, יוסף יצחק בן ביילה רחל, סטפן בן קטרינה, מיכל בת יעל, סרח בת בתיה, בתיה בת שרה, אורית בת אילנה, And uh, also for a Atzlacha uh, Rabah, for Shaul ben Farzane, Marsha bat Julie, her dear daughter Ayla bat Marsha. And all of Am Yisrael Bezrat Hashem will have a Atzlacha uh, Rabah, Refuah Shlema, Refuah Tanefesh, Refuah Taguf. Oh, and also, Le'avdil, a Refuah Shlema for Ari ben Aziza, Shlomo Yaakov ben Chaya Sara, and Moshe ben Sara. Kadosh Baruch Hu Yigidu Refuah Shlema, Refuah Tanefesh, Refuah Taguf. Also, for anybody that's in a uh, Refuah Shlema list, if a, uh, you're healthy, let us know, good news. Uh, oh, and also, before I forget, uh, Refuah Shlema for Esther bat Zipporah. הקדוש ברוך הוא גבר רפואה שלמה, אין דבורה בת מרסדס. So, a uh, slight update, because I know that a lot of people are asking us in regards to uh, Cooper City, our new community, Bezad Hashem. Uh, quite a few people are looking to move, uh, uh, number one, uh, out of wherever they are, and two, closer to a place that uh, has the, all the intentions in the world to build a community of Torah. Now, right now, Cooper City does not have much Torah in it. We live there, Baruch Hashem, so uh, we're planning on changing that. Uh, but it has, it is close to a, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of Jews that live in the, in the area. They're just uh, not religious. And uh, it's close to uh, a kosher supermarket. Uh, it's close to uh, different, uh, you know, needs that a person has. It's close by. But as far as like having a uh, Jewish school and a uh, synagogue and a learning center, things of that nature, that's Bezrat Hashem. That's Bezrat Hashem what we plan on doing and much more. Um, for the last couple of uh, months, we've been uh, looking at you know, uh, different uh, uh, opportunities of where to go, what to do. We found a place. We found a place that uh, looks like a right fit and it's a brand new construction. Uh, but it looks like uh, anti-Semitism is still alive and well. So uh, that's holding up that. But Baruch Hashem, you know, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, anytime he closes a door, he opens a bigger one. So uh, that's happened to us year after year. Every time we moved, you know, from different communities since I moved to uh, 
Sodom, I mean, to uh, Florida, I, uh, we've moved almost every year. And uh, every time the moving has been a mission of its own, uh, but, uh, you know, finding a place and so on. But Baruch Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, uh, even though he takes us on a, uh, you know, nice journey, uh, every time it's a bigger door, every time it's a, uh, you know, better this, better that. Baruch Hashem. So that's one of the things that a person needs to know is that before the light, before the light, it's the most amount of darkness. And uh, before the greatest opportunities that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to give you, is going to make it look like there's nothing. So, uh, Bezod Hashem, Bezod Hashem, there's a, uh, another place that wasn't available uh, about a month ago, but now uh, our dear friend, uh, who's uh, also our uh, broker, Michael Ben Melech, uh, called us today and said that uh, we'll go see this place tomorrow, different place, still within the same area, uh, that's uh, much bigger, much bigger than the other one, and much bigger than we need, but... If that's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants, then who am I to get in the way? He's paying for it anyway. Uh, so for anyone that's already ready to move, ready to move now, because again, they know they want to be there, they know that they don't want to be wherever they are, it's going to be within the same area. We haven't finalized the place, so don't ask me, oh, where's the place? Well, I need to know if I can walk to it or not. I don't know the place yet because we haven't finalized yet, but it's going to be within the same area because I live there. I don't feel like walking five miles to shul every day. Uh, so it's going to be within a, you know, figure a one-mile radius one way or the other. Uh, and uh, so I would say if you want to pick a spot, uh, it will be the Walmart the Walmart that's in Cooper City, in the cor corner over there of Flamingo. Uh, there's a Walmart over there. Uh, I believe the zip code is 33330. Easy enough to remember. That's the area. But to, uh, to make your life much easier, I would recommend you call Michael Ben Melech, our dear friend. He's a from Jew, very good guy. Helped us find our house, helped us uh, deal with a lot of interesting things over these last few months. And uh, Baruch Hashem, he's uh, helping us with this as well. So he knows the area, in essence. He's going to be the first one that knows which commercial place it is. Uh, and so you can call him if you, you, know, if, uh, you need to. Ask me, uh, just uh, text me, and I'll uh, text you his phone number. Michael Ben Melech. Always nice to deal with religious Jews that have Yerat Shemaim, uh, rather than just somebody that you don't know, simply because the uh, Torah says so. Now, the Gemara says that... To deal with somebody who does not have Yirat Shemaim, doesn't have fear of Hashem, is beyond dangerous. Beyond dangerous. On one end, on one end, if it's a non-Jew, the Gemara says if it's a non-Jew that is a barber, cuts hair. But uh, it happens to be that uh, today there's no business. He's by himself. He's by himself in a store says, don't go to him. Don't go to him. Go somewhere else or go when there's more people. Why? Maybe he'll kill you. Mamash, that's what the Gemara says. That's what the Gemara says. Why would he kill you? I mean, what does he have against you? We're not saying that every guy doesn't like a Jew. We're saying that there is a rule in the world called Esav Sonele Yaakov. That Esav hates Yaakov. But that hate is not always turned on. Why play with fire? Point being is that if a, if a uh, non-Jew is uh, not living the uh, life of Torah, he's not a righteous Noahide, he's uh, committed to idolatry and things of that nature, then uh, Gemara says, what, did you run out of uh, options? There's no Jewish barbers, there's no at least righteous non-Jews, there's nothing else. That's the same thing with business dealings. A lot of times people ask me questions about business dealings or different partners that they want to choose that are off characters. Oh, listen, I have this guy. He's, uh, you know, he wants to join in my partnership and so on. It's just that, you know, he's a uh, XYZ crimes that he's committed. You know, he stole from his last partner. He stole from this. He stole from that. But he wants to do business with me. What do you think? I don't think about things like that because why would you do it? Did you run out of partners in the world? Oh, listen, I want to marry this person, a really, really nice person. It's just that they uh, you know, have A, B, and C wrong with them. 
What do you think? I don't think. What, did you run out of people to marry in the world? And the same thing goes with everything. People simply make, a lot of times they make desperate choices as a result of their impatience and also their lack of amuna, their lack of faith in Hashem, where they feel like whatever choice is in front of them, that's the only choice available. Whatever door is in front of them, that's the only door available. It's wrong. You have to know that many times you have to learn and to te- you have to teach yourself how to say no to things. So the Gemara says, if a person does not have Yirat Shamayim, don't do business with him. Why not? On one hand, Avraham Avinu teaches us that somebody who doesn't have Yirat Shamayim is always suspect of a potential murderer. And you can say, what do you mean? The guy never murdered anybody. Yet. Yet. He didn't have a chance, he didn't have a need, he didn't have a desire. But even more, even more so, more practical and easier to believe to the skeptical mm-hmm. among us, if he does not have Yilat Shemaim, he's much more likely to fool you. I would rather use a different word, but he's much more likely to fool you in business. Why? Because if he's not afraid of Hashem, what's stopping him from stealing from you? What's stopping him from doing something that is unethical. Now you say, no, no, he actually uh, brought all of the customers from his last company to our new business, so he's doing good for us. Yes, he's doing good for you now because he sees a interest in what he has, but always remember, if he will do it for you, he will do it to you. This I learned from my dear wife. If he'll do it for you, he'll do it to you. He took the customers from his previous company, which obviously they didn't want him to do it, but he took it from them. Guess what? One day he's going to take your customers to his next uh, offer. Why? He has no Yilat Shemaim. He has no fear of Hashem. He, he's, not, he's not scared of what Hashem will do to him on Rosh Hashanah, on Yom Kippur. He's not scared of any of those things. He thinks he's uh, hustling. They call it today hustling. Stealing is called hustling today. You know? Gezel is hustling. Cheating is hustling. Everything's hustling. You know, that's the nice name, hustling. Uh, to make it look like as if you're doing something good. No, no, I'm just being ambitious. I'm just a thief, but I'm hustling. So, if someone knows not to deal with such people, and they still choose to, don't complain to Hashem about why somebody stole from you, why somebody cheated on you, You already knew that he's a womanizer before you married him. You decided to marry him. And now you're surprised that he's cheating on you? I don't understand. You already know that she likes to get attention from every single guy that walks. And you still decided to marry her. And now you're surprised that one of them ended up becoming a boyfriend? Why? Why are you surprised? No, I didn't think she could do it to me. Why not? She did it to everybody else. He did it to everybody else. Why not you? No, I thought she loved me. She did. She did love you. Just because they cheat on you doesn't mean they don't love you. They cheat because they have desire and they don't know how to control it. Like a dog or a cat or a lion or some other animal. But that's the question. Do you want to marry an animal or do you want to marry a you know, righteous person? It's a reality. A person needs to ask themselves that. Now, of course, a person that used to be an animal can do tshuva and can become a righteous person. Surely all of us are trying to do that ourselves. But the point being is that you're not supposed to marry into potential. Mm-hmm. Go into a relationship of potential. Where, no, hopefully she'll keep this and this. Hopefully he'll do this and this. No, no. You, at the time you're married, they already have to be on the right road. Why? Why would you take a risk? There are other choices. Well, listen, I'm already 25, I'm already 35, I'm already 45, I haven't gotten married. Okay, so it's better to stay single, single, than to be married to one of these people that's going to torture you for a few years before they throw you in the garbage. But that's the thing. Many times we don't have patience. Many times we don't have enough emunah and Hashem, and we make rash choices, which the Torah says, the stupidity of man will cause him to sin against Hashem and then he gets mad at Hashem for punishing him. So this is a simple FYI for everyone 
that uh, again, it's you have to make sure that you make the right choices. Now, if you live in a community right now that the only thing you have next to you is reform, conservative, and other forms of idolatry, whether it be Christianity or reform, it's the same exact thing. Unfortunately, sometimes you'll find a or a uh, orthodox shul that acts like a reform shul. You don't necessarily need to uh, be reformed to be reformed. One of my dear friends from the Iguda Rabbanim, I spoke to him last week, we had a wonderful conversation, and he said, you know what you made me realize? You don't have to be reformed to be reformed. You could be orthodox and reform at the same time. I never knew that, he said. Religious for 60 years, I never knew. You could be orthodox but reform at the same time. So I don't deal with this stuff until I started seeing the things that you're saying, and I checked it and said, you're 100% right. So if the places around you are reform, reform mentality, uh, and uh, obviously no signs of life, then you are responsible to move. Where? To a place that's going to have a better, a, uh, better Kedusha. Better for your kids, better for yourself. And you have to already start planning as soon as you possibly can, simply because this is, this is why you're in this world. And surely it's hard, surely it's expensive, and all of those other things. HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows that. But the point being is, that's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu is asking of us. Because we're going to come to Him in a few days with a lot of requests. First of all, we're requesting for Him to give us life. We're also requesting for Him to, since we're going to live, feed us too. And since you're going to feed us, feed us good food, not just any food. Don't feed us like oatmeal every day. You know, give us steak once or twice a week. You know, some chicken cutlets maybe, some eggplant parmesan if you like Italian food, maybe some Chinese food if you like quick food and you simply want to eat the whole night because you never get full off Chinese food. Or pizza if you like to you get fat and, you know, you want to look like your rabbi. Whatever. The point is, at least give me good food, Hashem. Not just any food. So we're going to ask him that. We're going to ask him for nice, wonderful things. Kadosh Baruch Hu is going to ask us, where were you until now? What would you do? Why? This is one of the lessons that we learned from Gemara Maseret Gitin. The time of the destruction of the Bet Mikdash, the Bilyonim, which were the modern day Zionists of the time, didn't like anyone having a different opinion than they do. They like their way or the highway. You weren't allowed to be a different mentality than them. They call it today cancel culture. In so many words, if you don't agree with us, we cancel you out. You are null and void. People think that that's what we do, but it's wrong. It's not that we cancel other people out. It's that they cancel themselves out by simply defying the Torah. Hashem canceled them out already when he wrote the Torah. If you say things that are contradicting the Torah, you are canceling yourself. We're not canceling you out. All we're doing is warning people about you. All we're doing is publicizing the fact that you are defying the Torah and thereby canceling yourself, canceling your own validity. If you publicize to the public things that are against the Torah, either because they're outright criminal, either you know, because they're outright forbidden, or perhaps even if they're just not recommended. It's not recommended to do certain things. Certain people publicize a unique opinion by a certain chacham. Who says you should publicize it? There are certain opinions in the Torah that the chachamim say, yes, it's true, but don't publicize it. This is something you teach one-on-one. -on -one. Only to a Talmud Chacham, someone that can understand and handle these specific rules. But there are certain people that want to get views, certain people that want to get likes, certain people that want to get followers. So he said, listen, if I talk about Moshe Rabbeinu, maybe there are people already have had enough about Moshe Rabbeinu. If I talk about the weekly parasha, maybe people are already hearing it from five, ten other sources. If I'm going to tell them about the mitzvah, they're getting it from a hundred sources. What can I tell them in order to grab their attention? Thereby making themselves movie stars. Because they're not interested in helping people. They're interested in ratings. They're interested in getting people's attention. Now those people 
by default, if you see somebody like that, it's like a shock jock that's just simply looking for attention. By default, he's already canceled himself out, even if he says things that are true. Because if what you're saying does not come naturally to you, that means it's not coming from the heart. If it's not coming from the heart, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Now, sometimes people are going to say certain alachot, certain rules, certain opinions of certain sages that are not for the public. You're allowed to learn them, but one-on-one, -on -one, and only if you're at a certain level. But people decide to publicize them anyway. People decide to do them anyway. And it's a person that we have to warn against. Why? Because again, this too can fool people into thinking that Judaism is something that it's not. You know, and you'll hear many times this coming from people that are usually unknown and are trying to make themselves known. Sometimes they'll even have the audacity to insult sages that are bigger than they could ever be even if they lived a thousand lives. Like you have some idiots in the world that decide one day to wake up and call themselves, I don't know, some type of Baba or Nazil or whatever they want to call themselves, you know, because they don't even know what it means themselves, and say that, you know what, there's certain sages, whether it be the Rambam or the Arizal, or anybody that pretty much people, unless they learn, they don't even know what they did and who they are, and say, no, he was wrong. His whole Torah is, don't learn it, it's not good for you. Anyone that tells you, any of the sages, whether they are 30 years from 30 years ago or 300 years ago or 1,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago, anyone comes out and insults them, by default, by default, that person has lost their ulamaba, just so you know. So you want to continue learning from somebody that's going to spend eternity in Genom, be my guest. Enjoy. Maybe you'll go there with them. You guys are so close together. But that's a reality. Why? To insult Tamidei Chachamim, the Gemara says, a person gets a makah from Shamaim, he gets a hit from Shamaim that there's no cure to it. Somebody that insults, big sages especially, but even an average Tamid Chacham, and even more so to build himself a stage, that person is called a kufil. Yeah, but he didn't go against God. Yes, he did, by going against God's. Soldiers, he went against God. Now, unfortunately, if you're not learned, you don't think of it as a big deal. Oh, yeah, no, this guy says that the Rambam is wrong here. This guy says that Rashi, we don't really need to listen to him. This guy says that Rizal, you're not allowed to learn his Torah. It's not even Torah, Bechlan. This little shoemaker that lives in 2020 thinks that the sages that toiled over Torah for 20 hours a day for 100 years, he's at their level. So, you have to know that if the person that's speaking does not honor and praise the sages, can't learn to love from them. Gemara Masechet Moed Katan, page 17, says a person like that, it's forbidden to learn to love from them. Forbidden. Because it's not just about learning Torah, but it's also Avat Torah. It's also about loving the Torah. And the Gemara says, foolish are the people that stand for a Sefer Torah, but not for a Talmit Chacham that walks in, which is a living Sefer Torah. You know, when you take out the Sefer Torah, Yishtabach Shimo, everybody has to stand, right? But the Gemara says, foolish are the people that stand for this, only for this, and not for a Sefer Torah that's walking. What's a Sefer Torah that's walking? Someone learns Torah all day. Needless to say, if he's one of the Gdolim, needless to say, if he's one of the Gdolim from previous generations, a person that does not praise the sages of previous generations, and in fact, mocks them, by default is a kufir baikal. This is a person you cannot learn any Torah from. But to know everything I just told you, you have to be a little bit learned yourself. And many times people are not learned themselves, and they think that someone that is insulting the sages of a previous generation, is an innovator. 
is uh, enlightenment. Why? Because they compare the Torah to politics. Because every new politician says that all the politicians before him are idiots. No new president thinks the last president was good. No new president thinks that is running is, uh, the guy that's running against him is good. All they do is insult each other, personally, and, uh, and every, every other way possible. So when people treat the Torah like they treat politics, surely you're going to have people saying, yeah, you're right, the Rizal is not good. I never liked him anyway, that guy. You even know who he was? You know what the Rizal even means? You know, it's not a real name, right? It's an acronym. Oh, that's not really his name? You don't like him, but uh, you don't even know that's not really it. But that's the problem, Rabotai. People are so ignorant today that we put ourselves in trouble because we make decisions with, without Yilat Shemayim, without fear of Hashem, fear of the Almighty. Rabbi again, Allah Shalom, asked once in the shiur, why does anybody think that Yeshua ben Nun, out of all the people, we had millions of people at Mount Sinai, millions of them. All of them were prophets. Everybody was a prophet. In fact, prophecy was at such a high level in that generation called Doha De'a, the generation of knowledge, that the lowest among them saw prophecy greater than the prophecy of Yechezkel. And Yechezkel... Yechezkel, who lived many, many years later, he saw things that are happening in heaven that we can't even understand what he's saying. And Torah says that although he saw great things, it wasn't even similar to the lowest level of prophecy of the generation of Moshe Rabbeinu. So everyone was a prophet of the generation of Moshe Rabbeinu. Everyone was a chacham. Everyone was good. Even Korach was a tzaddik until he went against Moshe Rabbeinu. From Korach comes Shmuel Navi, And the Gemara says Shmuel Navi is like Moshe and Aaron together. So everybody was good. Why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu decide to choose Yeshua ben Nun to be the Gdol Ado? He wasn't known as the smartest. In fact, the opposite. He was known as a Ksil. He was known as a fool. So you could say, yeah, but he was really, really humble. Okay, you're right. He was really humble. In fact, he was the most humble other than Moshe Rabbeinu. But there was something else. There was something else. And Torah tells us, Chamim tells us, what was that something else? HaKadosh Baruch Hu saw that Yeshua ben Nun is not like everybody else. Everyone else knew that Moshe Rabbeinu was going to Mount Sinai He's going to be in the heavens for 40 days and 40 nights. And they all just waited impatiently. Yeshua ben Nun decided to go with Moshe Rabbeinu as far as he can go and wait over there. Instead of going back to his wife and kids and life and the congregation and maybe uh, do whatever it is that he needed to do. No. No. He waited over there. He waited at the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. And Rabbi again says, why did he wait? For what? Because Yeshua ben Nun wanted to be the first to hear the Divrei Torah that Moshe Rabbeinu learned in heaven. What do you mean the first? It's not that far of a walk. It's not like once Moshe comes down, you and him are going to walk on the mountain for 40 days more. Or even four hours. I mean, it's, you know, from there to where the camp is, it's a uh, one, two, three. How much can you possibly learn? Yeshua ben Nun says, regardless of how much and who and what and when, those few moments is worth it waiting for 40 days and 40 nights. To have that Torah, that pure Torah, a few minutes early, it's worth it. Yeah, but Yeshua ben Nun, you may not even understand it. You're not exactly known as a genius. Yeshua ben Nun says, that doesn't make a difference. I understand it, don't understand it. What I do know, I love it. HaKadosh Baruch Hu saw Yeshua ben Nun's love for the Torah, and he decided at that moment, <coughs> Yeshua ben Nun's going to be Gdol Ado. What, he's missing some wisdom? <whistles> Insert it. Ding, became a genius. What's the big deal? What's the big deal? 
became a genius. Why? He loved the Torah. He loved the Torah. You love the Torah? You deserve the Torah. So when a person loves the Torah, by default, he loves Chachamim. He loves the rabbis. He loves the sages. He loves the people that toil over Torah. Whether it be a little boy that's in first, second, third grade learning Chumash, or it could be a big rabbi that's already on his 70th time completing the Shas. Whether it's a Avrech that's still struggling, whether he's going to stand Avrech or go into the business world, he's in his 20s, he just had his first kid, he's really struggling to survive, but he loves it, he's going in it, or it's somebody that decided already, I'm not leaving, I'm in the yeshiva, whether I write a book, don't write a book, I become a chacham, don't become a chacham, I'm glued here. You see that person, you get excited. Why? That's, that's your hero. Yeah, but you don't even know him. Exactly, that's my hero. You are my hero. Why? You toil over Torah. When you love Torah, you love the people that love Torah. You love the people that toil over Torah. Which means, if you're insulting those people, you're insulting the sages. You're insulting the people that have a stamp of kashrut on them. That they toil over Torah, that they love the Torah themselves. That means that not only are you a despicable person, but of course not a person that loves Torah, nor are you a person to learn from. And unfortunately today, just like we have a lot of good things that are publicized you know, in the, uh, in the media from, you know, as far as Torah is concerned, you could learn Torah regardless of whether you live in the Philippines or you live in America or you live in Israel. You could simply press a button and have an endless amount of Torah. An endless amount of Torah. Once you complete 2,000 um, uh, videos that we've made, you go to Robert Frame's 2,000 videos. By the time you complete those, we probably made another few thousand also, Yishtabach Shimo. And then after, while you're finishing that, there's a bunch of books that uh, Rav Ephraim wrote and we're working on and so on. And then once you finish that, you have other things and other things and more and more and more Torahs. Endless amount of Torah. Endless amount of Torah that you can learn. So a person that loves Torah wants every opportunity to learn Torah. He's not looking for a way out. He's not looking for a way not to learn. He's not looking for a way to insult it. But unfortunately, there are many people that unlike the good part, they are the bad part. All day, every day, all they do is insult the Torah, insult the Chachamim, make fun of the sages. Oh no, he's already old. He, um, he's, probably, he's, pro he's probably not all there. One of the dumbest things that a person can do is underestimate the Gedolim. Because they're 80 or 90 years old, he thinks that just because physically they can't go run a 40-yard uh, sprint at a four flat to make the NFL, he thinks that they simply also, their brain doesn't work. He doesn't realize that the Gemara itself testifies that Chachamim, Talmidei Chachamim, they get sharper with age. Meaning you, a little peon, 30, 40 years old, that who, who even knows if you've ever finished a book other than your own heresy, you think you're smarter than them. Why? Because you know how to use an iPhone. You have to be born and reborn a thousand times just to maybe, maybe get to their shoelace after they've told it of the Torah of 80 years. But that's the problem. People take their brain, dip it in Tuma, and think that Kedusha is going to come out of it. So, in the last few months, Rav Wasserman has been warning us time and time again to get ourselves away from Tuma, get ourselves away from impurity under all costs because this is what's going to bring a lot of damage to people individually and unfortunately as a nation. And the primary cause or contributor of Tuma, Rav Wasserman calls the shepherds, the leaders. They're the ones that produce the most amount of tum'ah, of impurity in the world, the most amount of lies, the most amount of political correctness that's against the Torah, the most amount of her heretical thoughts, heretical ideas, heretical speeches. And every single day, Hashem Mishmol, I just, I, I honestly, I just, every week, I just pray to survive the week. By the time Shabbat comes, I feel like I've achieved something. The amount of heretical things that people send me every day that they find 
that people write and oh this is a really popular book okay great I don't know who the author is no no he's a really popular rabbi okay so what's the question well you see it's a really popular book and it's a really popular rabbi but he wrote in this book that there is no such thing as suffering in Gehenna I said okay so the really popular book and the really popular rabbi are all going to be burned in Gehenna why that's what the Torah says to say that there is no suffering in Gehenna is 100% fira. You don't have to listen to me. Go to the Ramban, Shara Gmul. You'll see exactly what he says about those people. The Ramban, 900 years ago, wrote exactly about those people. To think it's only a parable that uh, Gehenna fire, it's only a, you know, not really thing, not really real, it's only embarrassment. He wrote it in there. He wrote it. You see what he writes? Hashem Yishmo. Yeah, but it's a really popular book. Okay, so I don't know. I guess a lot of people are going to follow him. What do, what do you want from me? I didn't write the book. I'm just telling you. This is what it says. He's a heretic. You're not allowed to learn from him. What, can I learn other things from him? No. You can't. Once he says this, you can no longer learn anything from him. Why? You no longer know if he's reliable on anything else. If he is a kofir baikal, if he says things that are 100% heretical, that are against the Torah, you don't know where else he's going to say it. So you can't, can't learn from them. And there are a lot of books today that have heretical thoughts and statements in them. Even more so videos. You have people that are famous, say all types of nonsense that I don't know where they get, but they say it on a regular time, on a regular basis. Now there's like a new trend. Every holiday, if you've noticed, every holiday we've had in the last two years, there's Mashiach predictions. Mashiach is going to come before Shavuot. Mashiach is coming before Pesach, or maybe right after Pesach. Mashiach is coming on Lag Baomer. Maybe it's Rabbi every, every holiday, there's the Mashiach, you know, prophets. The Mashiach prophets in, in all languages, in Hebrew, in English, in Spanish, I don't know, maybe Portuguese too, who knows? They're coming in all shapes and sizes. Everybody's a, everybody's a, is a prophet today. Even though the Rambam writes, Alacham Eforeshit, in Ilchot Melachim, you're not allowed, you're not allowed to predict the time of Mashiach. In fact, when you do it, you get cursed from Shemaim. But everybody's sharing these stupid videos of famous rabbis, or not famous rabbis, that are looking to become famous, predicting the Mashiach is going to come uh, before the holiday. Are you Eliyahu Navi? Are you Eliyahu? That's what you have to respond to. The, are you Eliyahu Navi? Because the only one that can say Mashiach is coming is Eliyahu Navi. If you're not Eliyahu Navi, you're Navi Shekel. You cannot predict when Mashiach is going to come. First of all, it's not allowed. Second of all, you don't know. Can he come? Sure. Why do you need to make a video about him coming on a specific date? No, this is the last Mashiach. This is the last Tarosh Hashanah. Are you a prophet? Are you a prophet? Is your name Eliyahu and last name Anavi? Did Akadosh Baruch Hu speak to you since the time of Pinchas? Did Akadosh Baruch Hu make miracles for you? Other than make these branches come out of your face, did he make anything else happen? Are you predicting Mashiach every holiday? Every holiday is a new Mashiach talks. Enough! Don't anyone that predicts the time of Mashiach, a specific date, stop watching them. Why? They may have been good until that day. They may have been good until that day. To say there's possibilities, yeah, there's always possibilities. There's always possibilities. I say it also. Possibly he could come tomorrow. Possibly he could come in a week. Poss it's always. So I tell them it's possible. It's one of our Ikele Amunah, one of the foundations of our faith. It's to believe that they can come at any given day. But to go out of your way and say, no, this is going to be the last Rosh Hashanah, this is going to be the last Pesach, this is going to be the last this, after Corona, before Corona. Day. Are you a prophet? Stop acting like it. Why? It causes much more confusion than anything else. And what these people do not understand is that when you become Mashiach obsessed and you just watch lectures about Mashiach, and you only talk about Mashiach, you know what happens? You become a crazy person. While remaining ignorant about the entire Torah. Why? 
Because you're so enamored about this Mashiach topic, you don't have time to learn Alachot Shabbat. You don't have time to learn Alachot of just simply how to do day-to-day -day prayers. You don't even know if, you're, if your sukkah is kosher bichlal. Five years you have the same sukkah, it's not even kosher because the, the, the walls are made out of fabric and it's flying back and forth like a, like a bird. It's not walls. And so on and so forth. No, but I think there's a leniency. Maybe Mashiach is going to fix this. Yeah, your Mashiach maybe. You have to understand. Mashiach is very much an important part of our religion, but it's not the ikal. It's not the foundation of our beliefs, meaning to the extent where you are all day you have to learn about Mashiach. That's Christianity. Christianity... That's them. That's what they do. Their whole religion is based on some guy that died and they believe he's going to come back from the sewer or where the, the, the where, sewer, bathroom? Where are they coming from? Oh, some place that he's in, the bathing in and some stuff. Well, that's, that's Christianity, Rabotai. And by the way, Mama Sechad Megillah says it's good, mitzvah, to make fun of Abu Dazara. So, anyway, so if you laugh, it's also good. Uh, anyway, so. That's Christianity. Their entire belief system is based on this yoshke. That's it. That's it. And all idolatry is based on some type of main, you know, person or, or personality of some kind. Don't turn the holy Torah into idolatry, into falsehood, into a fanaticism about something that you don't even understand yourself. People think the Mashiach is going to be some, maybe it's going to be like a Kiruv speaker that is really nice. It's, guys, enough. It's, it's, not, it's not going to be Kiruv speaker. The Mashiach is going to be a Demut, it's going to be a, a certain personality that the world has never seen before since the time of Moshe Rabbeinu. The Mashiach is going to be Kodesh Kodeshim. The Mashiach is going to be something that you cannot even fathom. All of the superhero movies that you've wasted your life watching cannot, cannot come to the foot of the Mashiach. He has to be a Talmud Chacham that knows the entire Torah. He has to be somebody holy. It's not going to be somebody you like because maybe you press like on his video. People have no concept of this. Just say, no, Mashiach is coming this way. Maybe he's the Mashiach because he's really old. Maybe he's Mashiach because he's really brave. Maybe... Enough. Don't turn the whole religion about Mashiach. Yes, but it's kind of ironic. The whole series about the era of Mashiach. How come? Because that's the important part. The era of Mashiach. Not the Mashiach itself. Why? We need to make sure that we know enough about the era of Mashiach to prepare ourselves to be able to survive those days and have the merit to see Mashiach whenever he comes. Before Rosh Hashanah, after Rosh Hashanah, in one year, in five years, and whenever the Shekadosh Baruch Hu decides to send him. But when people focus themselves so much about Mashiach, they simply lose their mind. They lose their mind, and unfortunately sometimes it happens to speakers and radio personalities. And one foolishness leads to another. They start predicting dates. They start giving you all types of weird zgulot and this. And it just becomes like horrible. Because what ends up happening is that all the skeptics out there, or perhaps even the followers, they have a date in their mind. Why? Because this rabbi said that he's coming on this date. This is going to be the last Rosh Hashanah. Well, guess what? They're one of those people that's going to remember. You know, a lot of people forget. That's why a lot of companies, for example, says, you know, you buy this in uh, you know, 30 days or your money back. It's not that they're so certain about their product. It's that they're certain you're going to forget that you can get your money back in 30 days. That's because you're probably not going to open it for two weeks. By the time you open it, it's going to take at least three weeks for you, for you to break it. So in reality, what ends up happening is a lot of these Mashiach predictors, they predict, no, Mashiach is going to come before Shavuot. Mashiach is going to come before Lag Baumil. Mashiach is going to come before such and such date. And in essence, they're also relying on people's forgetfulness that Shavuot came and went, Pesach came and went, Lag Baumil came and went, the whole year came and went, and he's still predicting. Why? Because they forgot he already was wrong 500 other times. They forgot 
And this happens to no end. I even know a guy, nice guy, but made a very, very bad mistake just a few months ago. He decided that according to his calculation, Mashiach was coming in four days. He even went out of his way to make videos about this. A countdown. Mashiach is coming on Thursday, such and such date in four days or whatever. I saw this and he sent it to me. I said, are you out of your mind? I mean, do, do, do you realize how many sins you're making? Oh, I don't understand why you're rejecting this. Why are you not supportive? Supportive? I wish you were right, but it's not allowed anyway. Even if you were right, it's not allowed. Even if you were right, it's not allowed. But no, they want Mashiach to come. Why? Because they have a wrong understanding of what Mashiach is. They have a wrong understanding of the era of Mashiach. And they're simply assuming that they're much more righteous than they are. They're simply assuming that Mashiach is going to come because you want him to come. Or at least you think you want him to come. And the reality is, Rabotai, is if everybody simply read the Sefer by Rav Wasserman, read the Gemarot that discuss it, read the different sages that discuss the times of Mashiach, their mindset would change completely. Because you would know that it's not the Mashiach that we should worry so much about, but rather the era of Mashiach. So over the last few months, Rav Wasserman has been telling us that during the era of Mashiach, these evil shepherds that are sometimes rabbis, sometimes politicians, sometimes teachers, sometimes other types of personality that's in leadership position, these are the people that are the primary source of impurity in the world. And worse yet, they are the primary reason why Am Yisrael has not done tshuva. This is what Rav Wasserman has spent telling us time and time again for months already. Each section with its own chidushim, each section with its own new insights. And now he moves on to the next chapter, which he calls Eitzat Torah, the Torah solution. Maya Adam kasha kazot. אתה罗马尼卡罗拉达米泰泽塔，שאלו תלמידו של רבי אליעזר，מהי אסיה אדם ב'ינצל מחבלי משיח？אמר להם יעסוק בתורה וביגמילות חסדים。חפץ חיים
time and time again by the Americans and by the other 31 nations that were so-called friends saying, no, we don't have any room for Jews. They had a meeting called the Evian meeting, like the Evian water. From now on, don't buy Evian water. No, I'm kidding. Evian water. They had an Evian meeting. 32 countries. None of them like Nazi Germany, so apparently. Everyone knows that the Jews are being murdered. No questions. But the Germans weren't massacring the Jews to the same, ex the highest level yet. In fact, they were saying, listen, get out of here. Hitler, Imach Shimov, said, listen, if you can get these Jewish people on a luxury ship just to get out of here, I'll pay for it. I'll give them luxury ships, just get out of our country. So you figure our friends would pick us up Give me a, a bed. Don't give me a bed. Give me a field to sleep in. Just give me a life. Give me the opportunity to live. All of these ships, one, uh, one disaster after another, one of the documented ones is a ship called St. Louis. The American government in 2009 admitted that they were mistaken. And their rejection of the ship that led to the death of hundreds and hundreds of Jews. They rejected the ship, they told them go somewhere else, and they ended up, all of those people, the vast majority of them, ended up being murdered as a result of this. How is this Yad Hashem? HaKadosh Baruch decreed, who's going to live, who's going to die, that Rosh Hashanah. Meaning there was nothing a person can do. You can get on a ship, you can get off a ship, it didn't make a difference. If HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided a, such a person was going to die, that person was going to die. If Hashem decided he's going to die in a concentration camp, or get shot, or fall off a boat, HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided. There's nothing that anyone can do. And that's scary. That's scarier to me, that's scarier than Gainom. Because that's a reality that you could literally see happening. You can literally see it happening. One day, all the people say they like you, hey, by the way, I don't like you anymore. Why? I just don't like you. Okay, can, can I still have my paycheck? No, actually, I just uh, cleaned out your bank account. You're not allowed to have money anymore. What? what? No, you're, it's not illegal. Oh, it was illegal until now. We changed the law. Who said? Me, I run the country. That's what it is. Yad Hashem looks like that, Rabotai. It's scarier than death. Everything can change in a second. That's what Rav Wasserman was taught living through. He was living in this time where Jews that were multi-millionaires all of a sudden were begging for change because the Nazis took everything they had. Even if they tried fleeing, many of them didn't survive. He didn't survive the trip or they get rejected by the Cuban government, by the American government, by others, the British, Imam, Imam, all of these people later on became so-called friends of ours. But it was a nightmare of a time. That's why you cannot judge anybody of that generation. You could talk about history. You can say we made certain mistakes because that's what Torah is. We go over our mistakes in order to, re to fix them. That's what the whole Tanakh is full of our mistakes. We talk about them so we don't repeat these mistakes because we see what was the outcome of these mistakes. But the point is you can't really judge anybody living in that particular generation. We say, oh, how come he didn't run away? How come he didn't fight back? You simply saw the hand was of Hashem, decided, that's it. doesn't make no more tshuva right now. This person, that's it. I decreed he's finished. That's scary. That's scary. So Rav Wasserman that was living through this time and is one of the people that was murdered in cold blood by the Nazis in Shimam Vezichram as Rav Osheri writes in his responsa one of the most extraordinary sfarim in the world that was written at the time of the Holocaust 
was written by Rav Osheri, an enormous Talmud Chacham, who saw it with his own eyes, with his own eyes, eyewitness, to Rav Wasserman's last speech, telling all of his students, it's clear that they have chosen us in heaven to die. Al Kidu Shashem in order to save our brothers in America. Instead of being worried about his life, instead of being worried about his kid's life that was right next to him, instead of being petrified, he's giving a shiur Torah. Rabbi Sheri that was right there was watching this and wrote about it. Miraculously survived himself by sneaking out and wrote about it. Eyewitness story, it's not a fairy tale. So Rav Wasserman that lived through this time of massacre is telling us what do you do during this time. So we're talking about someone that's not giving us a suggestion from the side based on theoretical knowledge. Like, what do you do in this time of what happened 2,000 years ago? Yeah, did you live through it? Because many times it's easy for us to say, yeah, you know what, if I was there, I would do that. Yeah, but you weren't there. And you don't know if you would do that because you weren't there. It's very easy to be what's called Monday morning quarterback. You tell the guy, listen, this guy on Sunday is the worst. Yeah, you're saying on Monday on your couch with the, with the donuts and the potato chips that he's the worst. You weren't on the field. You didn't know what the competition is. You don't know what his body was like. You don't know this. You don't know that. But it's easy for you to speak behind your, your donut. Very easy to, 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 uh, to criticize everything that happened yesterday and say you would do better. Or say, better yet, theoretical knowledge, where you assume certain things should work based on your theory. Rav Wasserman is not giving us theoretical knowledge. He's giving us practical knowledge as an eyewitness, as a person that's going through it himself. And he says the following, What is a man to do in such difficult time? Can he not be aided? The Torah confers upon us its counsel. And he brings a source from the Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin, page 98b. Rabbi Eliezer ben Holkinos was asked by his students, what can a man do to escape the pangs of the era of Mashiach? And he replied to them, let him employ himself in the study of the Torah and with overwhelming kindness, philanthropy. Now we've gone over this pasuk no less than a half a dozen times over the years. But only today did I finally understand what this means to the level that I understand it now. Thanks to Rav Wasserman and the Chafetz Chaim. You see, the Gemara says, Ya'asok Torah u'begminut chasadim. To deal, deal with the Torah, delve into it, toil over it, comply with the Torah, learn the Torah. But then the Chafetz Chaim, quoted by Rav Wasserman, gives us a much clearer explanation. What does it mean, Ya'asok Torah? Here, the English translation, which in my opinion, this English word that they use, which is employ, employ himself with the study of Torah, is a better translation than I've seen elsewhere. And you'll see why, based on what the Chafetz Chaim says. Rav Wasserman says, the Chafetz Chaim remarked, he commented on this pasuk, what does it mean that he shall employ himself in the Torah? This means the Chafetz Chaim, that a man should apply himself to the study of the Torah and through philanthropy, in the same spirit that he applies himself to his employment, meaning with all of his heart and with all of his power. Only then can he hope for the salvation, for deliverance. 
So it's not just, listen, if you learn Torah and you do some kind things, everything's going to work out. Mistake. If that's what we understood until now, we made a mistake. Because the Chafetz Chaim says it's not quite. It's not quite that you are going to learn Torah, you're going to come to Yeshua a few times a week, you're going to learn a little bit at home, you're going to give some money to Kiruv, and that's it. You can expect you're going to be on first class. Mashiach comes, nothing to worry about. You have like a little special spiritual sphere protecting you from the Amalek that's around. Chafetz Chaim says, you're mistaken. It's not just learning Torah. It says specifically, Yasok Torah, meaning he shall employ himself in Torah. What does that mean? He has to learn his Torah with the same passion, the same effort, the same zeal, the same excitement as he does when he's chasing a million dollars in business. What is that like? If you're in a certain types of businesses, a deal can make or break you, especially if you're a business owner, where you could have a certain contract or a certain deal or certain prospective client or existing client that can generate enough business in a single transaction that could literally allow you to build an empire, to give yourself stability, or break your company in half. If your business has the over 50% of its revenues, in fact, even if it's over 30% of its revenues, coming from a single client, you do not have a very good business because your business is not stable. Now, you may think it's a good business because your business, let's say, is generating $10 million and you don't think that it's such a problem that five or six million of it is coming from, I don't know, Apple, because Apple's a good company. But that's because you're assuming that Apple will still want you next year when there's constantly competitors trying to eat your head. And what ends up happening to businesses like this that have a big client where it's the majority of their revenues, what happens? One day that client says, hey, by the way, we had good times. Remember that time we went there? Remember that time we did this? Remember that time? Yeah, it was a good time. What are you saying? Uh, that was a good times. Sayonara. Or I say in uh, Yiddish, shalom. What do you mean shalom? We found a better deal. What's the better deal? Who? Who is it? Oh, uh, well, it's actually nobody you know. What do you mean? Well, it's nobody you know because we just simply decided to replace your service by doing it internally. Yeah, but it's going to cost you three times as much. Yeah, we don't really care. We don't really care it's going to cost us three times as much. We just decided that we want to do everything that you do for us internally so that we have complete control. And that's what happens many times. A, a person, a small business, could literally lose the entire foundation of their business in a single moment. One phone call. Now, of course, that business owner, if he's a fighter, he's going down fighting. What does he do at that moment? Everything. No, no, listen, listen. Let's meet about this. I'm going to come. No, no, we're, we're in Australia. What do you mean you're going to come? We're in Australia. I'm on the next plane. I'm already at the airport. I'll see you in 17 hours. You don't have to come. We're not going to change our mind. No more. Don't, don't say that. Don't say that. Come on. We've been doing business for 10 years. Don't say that. I'm going to see you in 17 hours. Wait for me. The guy feels bad, says, okay, fine. You decided to go jump on a plane, pay five, ten thousand dollars for a plane ticket. Extra, just because you're crazy. You don't sleep for three days straight. Go over there, convince him, all types of new brochures, change the price, change the terms, change everything, change your life. Listen, I'm sorry guys, I'm only working 18 hours a day for you guys. You know what? From now on, I'm gonna divorce my wife. So now from now on, I'm gonna work for you guys 20 hours a day. I put my kids in a, in, in, in a nice, like, uh, you know, like a cage, so they're not going to bother me anymore. My wife, I let her go, and that's it. I'm, gonna work, I'm only for you guys. I'm everything. 
You're going to give away your wife, your kids, everything. Why? You want this client. Why? Because this client is your business. A guy's looking for a big client. He knows this client can make or break him because he's got a lot of money and he's also got a lot of friends. What does he do? He flies around. He winds and dines. He says stupid things. He, see, he pretends to be. He pretends not to be. He does all types of things. He wakes up at 4 o'clock in the morning just to answer the guy's phone call even though usually he wakes up at 11. But for him, he wakes up at 4. Because he wants the new client. A guy has a new idea, new business, new thing. What does he do? He loses sleep. He decides, listen, from now on, well, I'm only going to sleep three days a week. What, what about the other four days? I'm going to simply work through it. Why are you going to kill yourself? Because I'm trying to build the next Google. I'm trying to build the next Facebook. I'm trying to build the next empire, and I don't have time to sleep. So I'm simply not going to sleep. I'm just going to work like a dog. And he works, and he works, and he works to build this thing because he thinks that his company is going to be the next big thing. He's going to be on Silicon Valley. He's going to be on this. He's going to be on that. Guy works out every single day. Puts bench presses 5,000 tons. Every day he puts a house on his head. Every single day he runs and he slides and he does all these different things for years on out. Why? One day he wants to make the pros. One day he wants to be on ESPN on some highlight film. One day he wants to be the guy who says, oh, and the first draft pick is such and such. And he wants it to be him. One day, draft pick comes, he doesn't get picked at all. But until that day, he worked and he got up early in the morning and he ate weird food and he did all types of strange things. Why? For that big day. All of those people are exactly the same. That is, they're driven to success. They're ambitious. And Hafez Chaim says, you know all those people do you admire? Those Steve Jobs of the world. Those Jeff Bezos of the world, those, those major people that you read about, the bios and you, the interviews and how they have a weird schedule and all of this stuff, you admire all of them and because you admire their success and you want to be like them and you're trying to have a schedule like them and a diet like them and clothes like them and a mentality like them and you even speak like them and you even want to look like them. Right? Chafetz Chaim says, you have to do that with Torah. That's what La'asok Torah means. All of that energy that you're investing to become the next Google, to become the next Microsoft, to become the next Bill Gates, to become the next big thing, all that energy, all of those conditions that you're breaking just to make it you gotta do it for the Torah too you can do it there also if you want I mean I don't know if you can necessarily do it for both maybe it's possible who knows but if you become the next big Microsoft it doesn't put you in Gan Eden if you become the next greatest athlete the world has ever seen doesn't affect your Gan Eden at all. In fact, if Gogo Magog starts the day that you arrive at the Olympics, your event will be canceled. Your life's work will go into the garbage pail. It will not help you at all. And Hafez Chaim says, this is why all of those changes you're willing to make in order to succeed in such and such an endeavor, all of those things, you have to do that for the Torah, for your learning of the Torah. That is what it means, la sopa Torah, to employ yourself in Torah. You fight for the Torah like you fight for those contracts, you fight for those clients. You fight for that money. You have to fight for the Torah. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. You're dead tired, but you haven't learned a single minute of Torah that day. Guess what? You have to push and go learn. How much can I possibly learn at 3 o'clock in the morning? I'm tired. i got to wake up in a few hours. As much as you can. 5 minutes, 10 minutes, a half hour, whatever you can. Yeah, but I'm going to collapse. Okay, so you collapse. 
Would you do it for a million dollars? I'd study till the next day for a million dollars. <laughs> okay, you just raised anti. Whatever you're willing to do for money, for success everywhere else, that's what the Chafetz Chaim says you have to do for Torah. If you want to be saved from Chavle Mashiach. If you're just learning Torah while you're eating a little bit of Bamba and Beastly, have a coffee, TV's in the background, the phone doesn't stop uh, buzzing and doing, and you're just hanging out, you know, your wife brings you a nice bologna sandwich with some pickles on it. Tell, no, no, I don't like pickles. Take them out for me. And you have enough, you mean, enough care about the sandwich that you even know, you notice the pickles, Bechlal. That's how much you like. That kind of toy is not going to help you. Mashiach, times, the era of Mashiach, no protection. How come we don't do that? How come it's, this sounds so foreign to us? The average person is now listening to this and says, I, I, I can't do that. This is insane. What do you mean? I have to chase Torah like I chase money? I didn't even go to Yeshiva my whole life. I don't know why that, uh, all the excuses are no. How come? That's because we don't value the Torah the way we value money. And that's our mistake. We value money much more than Torah. We value our physical endeavors much more than we value our Torah. To find out a new insight in our chumash does not mean as much to us as finding a new customer. Because we figure that, listen, if I get this customer, then I'll be able to pay the mortgage, and then I'll be able to give some donations, and then I'll be able to have a peace of mind to go learn Torah. But somehow it never really happens. Somehow the richer a person gets, the less he learns. There are, surely are some people that are wealthy and also Tamidah Chachamim. No questions asked. But as a, on a general perspective, it doesn't work that way. Where the more successful a person becomes, the more time he has to learn Torah. It doesn't work that way. In fact, the more successful he becomes, the busier he becomes which makes him less likely to learn Torah because he has so many things to deal with now. But that means that we're not as dedicated to the Torah as we are to our business. And therefore, we're not fulfilling what Rabbi Eliezer ben Holkan has said will end up protecting us. Now, how can a person change their mindset about Torah for this specific purpose. Now, if you were ever successful in business, or you were ever in doing something, imagine yourself at work. And all of a sudden, the reports came in, a bunch of money came in, but they lost the counting of what was in, what was out, who belongs to what, and they say, listen, you're the boss, count how much money it is. Okay, where's the calculator? No calculator. Okay, you gotta count it. Okay, uh, you, it's all in hundreds? Oh, it's all hundreds, twenties, fifties, you know, all types of things. All right, is it, what, is it a small little envelope? No, no, it's a whole room full. What? Where did it come from? We're not really sure, but it's a whole room full of money. And you have to count it manually. Would you object? Would you have a tough time saying, nah, I don't feel like counting this money. I don't want to. I'm tired. Who here is a big enough light to say that they don't want to count that money? Who here is going to say, I'm tired, too tired to count the money? No, no, I don't feel like counting. Who's going to get tired of counting the money? What's the guy going to do? Put on his sweatpants, put on uh, I don't know, some headphones, Make himself a little little camp chair inside the room if he could fit it. And start counting. One, two, three. Oh, I like this one. Four, five, six. Oh, look, it's a new bill. Seven, eight, nine. Oh, thousand dollars. Okay, just you little package. I'm going to call you Steve. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, I'm going to call you Dave. And he start naming all the piles of hundreds. Never getting tired. 
three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning. Now all of a sudden, you're not hungry, you're not thirsty, you don't need to go to the bathroom, you don't want to take a break. Your wife calls you, say, listen, honey, I'm, I'm busy. What are you doing? I'm counting money. Okay, I'm coming. All right, you come too. And all of a sudden, both of you, one, two, oh, that's Steve. Oh, I'm sorry, Steve, I stepped on you. Okay, three, four, five, you start singing tunes. All of a sudden, you guys love each other. I miss you, I love you, yeah, yeah. Listen, tell Steve. And all of a sudden, you can go there for three days, counting money like you're in Gun Eden. Never objecting to this manual labor. Never objecting to all of a sudden you're busy and you have an appointment at the auto vehicle department. All of a sudden the doctor's appointment is no longer needed. All of a sudden your pain on your side is not painful anymore. Why? You're busy. What? Counting money. Chafetz Chaim is trying to tell us this. Rav Chaim elaborates. He says, Chafetz Chaim is trying to tell us just like you are never going to object to counting all of your money, you should never object to counting all of your mitzvot. You should never object to counting all of the Torah that you learned. When you go over what you learned that day, and you think about, oh, Moshe Rabbeinu said that. Oh, Rabbi Akiva said that. Oh, and Rabbi Eliezer said that. Oh, it's in the Gemara Brachot. Oh, it's in the Gemara Chayiga. Oh, eh, eh, eh. Oh, all day you're thinking Torah. Like David HaMelech. Kol Hayom Yisichati. All day it's, it's my conversation. Why? I'm counting my millions. Not my hundred dollar bills. I'm counting all the words of Torah that I learned all day. Ishtabach Shimo La'ad. Each one of them is priceless. Each letter. Each letter in the Torah that you read is worth than all of the money in the world from the beginning of the world until the end of the world. If you start understanding that the Torah that you have is the only thing that can get you to Gan Eden, that can get you to anything that's of any value in this world or the next, you'd start appreciating that Torah that you have much more than appreciating that little imaginary story I just gave you now of counting the thousands and naming them. A person that starts to count his mitzvot, starts itemizing them, starts looking at them, this is what I achieved today. This is, what does he start doing? He starts having a report. He starts having a schedule. It's like, listen, this last week, I'm terrible. I only studied five dapim in the Gemara. What am I, uh, something wrong with me? No, no, come on. What's wrong with me? Five dapim. You start yelling at himself. Five dapim the whole week. What's the matter with you? You start looking at Tamir. What's the matter with you? Start yelling at yourself. Don't you understand? This is Gan Eden. Now, okay, next week, we're making it up. Next week, it's ten dapim to make up for this week and next week. And he start, what? You have a report. For who? For yourself. For yourself, I want to learn more. I want to do more. I can't believe I just made that blessing. If I was God, I wouldn't even accept that blessing. I would throw that blessing in my face. But I can't do another blessing because it's uh, using Hashem's name in vain. So next time I have to remember, blessing X. I have to put a check next to it. Every time you do mitzvah, oh, I just gave tzedakah, ishtabach shimo. Hashem, you gave me money to give tzedakah as a yofi. It's so much fun. Hashem gave me money for what? For me to make mitzvot. He doesn't look at it, he's like, ah, come on, why did this guy go get a job? What do I have to give him money for? No, he looks at it as an opportunity, another mitzvah. This is why Rabotai Karim, the teachings of the Torah, without Musar, will always be missing a link that applies that Torah to your life. For example, in the Chumash, we've read it every year, at least once, in Parashat Bechukotai, chapter 27, verse number 2, it talks about how they have to bring the sheep through a narrow opening, one by one, in order to give Maser. 
And you have a herd of sheep. You have a thousand sheep. You have 20,000 sheep. You have 100,000 sheep. The system, nonetheless, is exactly the same. You have to put one after another, single file, through the door, through this narrow door, so two can't fit it. This is also how we're judged. The Gemara says, Masechet Rosh Hashanah, how we're judged on Rosh Hashanah. Single files. Everybody, you're judged individually. You're judged individually. You're judged individually. Everyone's judged individually. Like sheep. So the Chumash tells us that Maser, you want to give the tithe the 10% from your sheep, from your cattle, is the way it's done. Count. 10 at a time, the 10th one, put it aside. That's the Maser. That's the Maser. Now you think to yourself, that's a really old-fashioned system. Can't I just use a computer? I know how many sheep I have. I know how many sheep gave birth. I know how many sheep I stole this, I stole that. Why can't I just run the calculator? Okay, I got 30,000 sheep, 3,000. Okay, that goes to the Beit HaMikdash. What do I need to go? One, two, three, no, come on. I get confused. Wait, did you're the first one that asked this question? Take Maraim Maseret Bechorot, page 10b, asks the same exact question that you're asking today. Not with the computer. But I simply ask, what if the guy gets confused? It's got 30,000 sheep. You ever see 30,000 sheep? It's a lot of sheep. It's a lot of sweaters. 30,000 sheep is a lot of sheep. Each one has to go through this narrow door and have to count. Just counting them takes probably a few days. One, two, no, come on, sheep, yalla, you guys are so slow. No, sheep, yalla, yalla, I got to get home already. One, two, three, the sheep are already going to sleep. Well, it's all so long. Why does it have to go? What if the guy gets confused, the Gemara asks. What's the psak? He still has to do it that way. Risking getting confused. Why? Why? Come to Baalei Amusal. Come to Baalei Amusal and and they tell us this is why. If you were given 30,000 sheep, and the Torah tells you you have to give 10% to the sake of the Torah, you have to give 3,000 sheep for the sake of the Torah, you're saying, no, you're kidding me? Come on, 3,000? What did I need so many sheep for? It's not even that big of a building. They have to, what they have, what they, what do they have like a, a special sweater store or something over there? Where they, that, they, maybe they don't need to eat that much, maybe. Why do they need to eat so much? Leave something for other people. You start coming up with all types of excuses of why they don't really need 3,000. It's too much for them. Or maybe I really don't owe 3,000 because, you know, maybe I'm not going to make that much in the end. Maybe some of them are going to die. It's hard for you to write a check for 3,000. It's hard. Why? Because you're figuring 30,000, I worked hard for it. I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning every day. I fed them, I this, I that. I toiled over this money. It's hard to just write a check for 3,000. 10% of what I made, come on, I made a million dollars. It's 100,000 a month. What do you think? It's easy to make 100,000 a month. So what, now I have to give $120,000 for, for Kiro? What do you create? What did he do for it? He didn't even work in my company. The guy makes speeches on YouTube. I only like some of them. I have to write him a check for $120,000. Why? Come to Baalei Musa and they say that's exactly why. You think you made it. That's the problem. That's why Kadosh Baruch Hu, that knows his creation, set up a system of how to give Maser because he knows the weakness of his own creation. He knows it's hard for you to finish. The end of the year finished. You got your 1099. You got your W-2. You got your net check of what you were supposed to get after this and after that. Bottom line is, you got your 100,000, your million, your whatever it is. For you to take 10% or more out of that and just write it to give it to Torah, it's going to be hard. Especially as you make more and more money. It gets hard. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to count together. One sheep that I gave you is for you. Two sheep is for you. Three sheep I gave you, you keep that one too. Four sheep, you keep that one too. Five, 
That's for you, kid. I love you. Six. Baba. No, come on. Mabruk. Enjoy. Seven. That, Abba, don't you want anything for you? No, 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 kid. No, you, you have. You have. Seven. It's for you also. Eight. Give it to your wife. Buy something nice. Nine. Maybe your kids want a new bicycle. Give it to them. Ten. Okay, you know, I'll take this one. That's it, Abba. Just one. Now you look how much you gave me. No, it's okay. It's okay, kid. No, let's keep counting. One. It's for you. Again, me? Yeah. Two. That's for you. Three, four, five. Eight, nine for you. One for Abba. When a person starts counting how many blessings that Kadosh Baruch Hu gave him or her, one at a time, he starts feeling bad that he's only giving 10%. But if a person looks at the grand number, no, come on, it's too much. That's why the Baal Musal take the Torah and apply it to our life, regardless of what generation you're alive in. Now, Rav Wasserman continues saying that after we learned this extremely important lesson from the Chafetz Chaim of what does it really truly mean to employ ourselves in Torah, as that is the only protection we can have in these times. He brings a verse from the Song of Songs, Shira Shirim, chapter 8, verse 8. What shall we do for our sister when she's spoken about, when she's spoken against? The Jewish people in the exile have been likened to a sheep among 70 wolves, meaning the 70 nations. In such a position, the wisest policy for the sheep is to endeavor to become forgotten by the wolves. No good can come to the Jewish people unless the nations of the world apply themselves to other matters and pay no attention whatsoever to them. Because at a time when the people talk increasingly about us, great is the danger which threatens. Here, Rav Wasserman says something that is the exact opposite of the world's mentality today. The world's mentality today is any attention is good attention, even if they're destroying you in the media. In fact, there is not a day that passes that the Jewish people are not in the media for one reason or another. This wasn't always the case. In fact, if you look throughout history, we have repeated a pattern, and we're repeating it now. Over the last 70 years or so, since the time or more, 80 years, since the time of the Holocaust, for the vast majority of that time, the only thing the world really knew us and was reminded about us for on a regular basis and a national scale is the Holocaust. Holocaust. Never again. Six million Jews were murdered. Some people felt bad. Some people cared less. But nonetheless, that's what Jewish people were known for for much of that time. They didn't really care so much about us and other things. Once in a while, we got into war in Israel. Once in a while, you know, we invented something new, got a Nobel Prize. But the national scale wasn't exactly what it is now, or the recognition of the Jewish people, wasn't as much as it is now. Now we're in the news every day, whether it's the Israeli government, or it's one of the uh, people in the business world, or it's something. Every day we're somewhere. Every day. Now what's the difference? Rav Wasserman says, we, as a people, Torah calls us, we're the sheep surrounded by 70 wolves that want to eat us. And the best thing we can possibly do is do whatever we can, actually invest our effort to make sure that the wolf forgets we're even in the room. He gets so busy eating something else, climbing over something else, doing anything else but thinking about us. Why? Because as soon as he starts talking about us, all of a sudden he gets hungry. If you notice, Rabbi Karim, 
after the Holocaust, anti-Semitism dropped precipitously. Yeah, they already killed six million of us. But suddenly the world became merciful over the Jews for a long time. Modern Israel was born. Jews were being employed in different places and for more or less the world knew us based on the Holocaust, cared less so much. Just simply let us move on. What did we do during that time? We prospered. Suddenly the Jewish people started getting out of the rut that they were in, the genome that they were in, the nightmare that they were in, whether they were inside the concentration camps or that family there or whatever it is, but we had to move forward. So we started little businesses. We started working for different people. We started doing whatever it is that you need to do to survive. We were focused. We had to move on. And many prospered, building major companies discovering major things, designing all types of fields. Suddenly you have more Nobel Prize winners per capita that are Jews than any other nation in the world. Unbelievable statistics. The greatest discoveries in the technology world have a headquarters. And it's not Silicon Valley, it's Israel. Everyone knows it. Microsoft, Intel, Google, uh, all types of extraordinary microprocessor technology. Unbelievable things were discovered in this tiny little country that unless you know where it is, you wouldn't even know it existed. And if that's not enough, the Jewish people that lived in the exile did just, uh, just as much. The little tiny Jewish community all of a sudden took over the city, all of a sudden took over a community, all of, the, all of a sudden building buildings. All of a sudden you see major real estate developers with a Jewish name. All of a sudden you're seeing major things. Jewish people, no one cared, but hey. Same thing in previous times. Went through some type of inquisition, some type of pogrom, some type of nightmare. The world forgot about us. We went back to our lives. We continued building and quietly we started prospering. We started building again. We have brought more positive things to society than all of the civilizations in the world combined. Quietly. When did it all go bad? When it stopped being quiet. All of a sudden we want media attention. All of a sudden I want to be a politician. All of a sudden I want to run for president. All of a sudden I want to be a senator. All of a sudden I want to put my name on that Hollywood film. All of a sudden I want to put my name on that bank. All of a sudden I want to make sure that there is a memorial for everything that I ever did. And cut attention, attention. And I want everyone to talk about me. And all of a sudden, they start talking. But not the type of talking we want. All of a sudden, they're reminded that Esav sonet Yaakov, that Esav hates Yaakov. Where do these Jews get all the money from? Oh yeah, they're stealing. Oh yeah, it's because of this. Oh yeah, it's because of that. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. And they start making up all of these fake things. Unfortunately, some real things. But the point being is, they are reminded of what? The hatred that they had in the previous generation. The hatred that was dormant, the hatred that actually went away for enough time to allow us to prosper. And now it's back by our own doings because we forgot we were sheep. We forgot we were sheep because we started wearing the wolf's clothes. And that's what Rav Wasserman is saying to us, that at a time that people's talk increase about us, great danger is what threatens us. It's not good for the sheep to be noticed. It's outright stupid for the sheep to call attention to himself by the wolves. 
And the Midrash Tanchuma says that the angels had a conversation saying, what shall we do for our sister, Am Yisrael, when she shall be spoken of? Meaning, when, all of, when Edom speaks about Am Yisrael, what should we do to protect them? This question came, the answer of the Almighty, Ishtabach Shimo. And he said, if she will be a wall, we will build upon her a turret of silver. Meaning, if they are strong in their faith, in their amuna, like a reinforced wall, and will not yield before any wind, we will build upon her a turret of silver. Just as silver enters the furnace and emerges whole, so will Amisel enter among the nations and come out unscathed. Just as the Pasuk in the book of Exodus, Parashat Shmot, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. So the angels are talking to among themselves and say, what should we do to help our sister Am Yisrael? Why? Esav is talking. Esav just remembered he hates Yaakov. He was sleeping for 40 years straight. But all of a sudden he woke up today and says, you know what? This Yaakov got too rich on me. This Yaakov is, what is he doing buying a house in my neighborhood? This Yaakov, he's wearing a new suit. Where do you get the money to get a new suit? This Yaakov looks better than me now. Why? What is he doing here? All of a sudden, Esau decides that uh, his long-lost heritage of hating Jews is important to him suddenly. What should we do, the angels say? Akadosh Baruch Hu himself says, if they have emunah, if they're close to me, if they're glued to the Torah, they are like a wall. None of Esav's people can touch them. Just like the fire could not burn the bush at the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, where the bush was burning, but nothing was consuming it. Nothing can consume Am Yisrael. Why? They're glued to me. They have a spiritual fire of Torah around them. But then he continues, and he says in the Song of Song, continues, and says that if she will be a door, like a door which turns on its hinge, we will enclose her with boards of cedar, which is a type of wood that rots quickly. If they are swayed in every direction, like the door which turns, that is, if they are inundated by every temporal stream, allowing themselves to be influenced from every side, then they will be like the wood which allows wallows in damp places and ruts. In so many words, Rav Wasserman brings us the source. When we are glued to Hashem and we have a Muna in Hashem, the Goim can't touch us. A Sav, as much as he hates us, can't touch us. Whether it's because Hashem is simply going to make him afraid of us, or forget that he hates us, or weaker, whatever Hashem decides to do is really irrelevant. It's not our business. How Hashem makes a Sav forget that he's the wolf. But that's only because we're glued to Hashem. It's like a little kid feels tough. Why? Because his father is standing behind him. It's like, what? Why? What do you want? Why? Why? He's like little. The other guy's nine feet tall, but he's not scared of the little kid. He's scared of the father. It's Amalek. I'm behind him. He's like, yeah, yeah, we got it. Yeah, yeah. That's us. That's us. One more tzadikim. Why? What do you want, Esau? Why? Why? Because Hashem is behind us. He sounds like, you're nothing. I don't want nothing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You need me to help you? I'm sorry. That's Esau. When? We're glued to Hashem. We're not glued to Hashem. You say, Esau, what do you want? Pah! Don't ever talk to me like that again, Jew. I'll put a star on you. To remind you, you're a Jew. 
And that's what happens. Time and time again. Why? Hashem says, when you're not close to me, I hide my face. Esav can't see me. Because you're not even looking at me. Now, if you notice, I learned this from Rabbi Ephraim today. I believe it's not a coincidence, to say the least. The swastika of the Nazis, Imach Shimam Vezichram, anyone that knows the Hebrew uh, language, the Hebrew alphabet, you see that the swastika is two tavs. The letter tav, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. If you position it a certain way, you see that the swastika is two tavs. It draws two tavs. Now what's tough? Tough numerical value, 400. 400. And the Chida brings that 400 is the number for the source of all the impurity of the world as we learn from the story of when Esav comes to meet Yaakov with 400 generals. 400 generals. Now, one thing that you'd learn from history of the Jewish people and from their enemies is that whether it was Nebuchadnezzar or it was Haman, or it was Hitler in Machimo. All of them were idol worshippers. And by the way, as a correction, it wasn't the Chida that said that Taf is 400, that's a source of Tumah, but rather the Benishchai. The Benishchai said it. So, Nebuchadnezzar knew about God but was an idol worshiper. Haman knew about God but was an idol worshiper. Amalek knew about God but were idol worshippers. Hitler, Yimach Shimo, knew about God, idol worshiper. In fact, all of the greatest enemies that Am Yisrael has ever had were deep into idolatry, whereby the greater the impurity that they had, meaning the more zealous they were about their idolatry, the more they hated Yaakov, the more they hated Am Yisrael. Now, what reminds Esav of Yaakov? Us. We remind them of it. How? When we start acting like him. Now, I had a chidush today, a new insight, that puts things into perspective of what of Wasserman says. He says that on one end, when people talk about us, it's not good. If we're glued to Hashem, we become like a reinforced wall and a sub can't teach us, can't touch us. When we are like a revolving door, we come in and out, we change because we are constantly influenced by the other sides, instead of being a wall, we turn into a wood that rots. And Esau is able to kick the door down and do whatever he pleases after. Now, the Chachamim teach us that 
There's nothing new under the sun. Shlomo HaMelech says this in Proverbs, but in other books as well, it says that nothing new under the sun to the extent where the first goel is the last goel. Meaning the first Mashiach is the last Mashiach. Meaning that it's going to be Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu is the first Mashiach. Some even believe he'll be the actual Mashiach itself, and some believe it'll only be a spark of Moshe. But needless to say, it's saying that there is a connection, there is a serious connection, between the time of the Exodus, where our first Mashiach arrived, to the time the last Mashiach arrives. Time of Mashiach, Gogu Magog, all that. It's a serious connection. And the Zohar Kadosh says that everything that happened in Egypt will happen again, but just bigger. And the book of Jeremiah says that it's going to be much bigger, to the extent where Hashem is no longer going to be remembered as the God that took Am Yisrael out of Egypt, but rather the God that took Am Yisrael out of the land of the north. Meaning that what happens before Mashiach comes will be much more grand, much more miraculous, much more extraordinary than what happened at the Exodus with the ten plagues, what happened at the Exodus with the splitting of Yam Suf. It'll be much more miraculous. Why? This is the final hurrah. And surely it has to be bigger. And the Zohar Kadosh gives a few examples. It says, just like there was three days of darkness and the darkness plague, at the time of Mashiach, 15 days of darkness. Because that's going to be the time where Kadosh Baruch Hu is going to destroy all of the Rishayim and remove them from the world. And he's not just talking about non-Jewish people. Jewish people too, unfortunately, that have not done tshuva, will be destroyed during the darkness plague. Now, 15 days of darkness, it's not a good look, by the way. And your light is not going to work either, even if it's LED. Or LED, I think they say. Now, the point being is, is that there's a very deep connection between the first exodus and the last one. Now, I asked today, what really gave us the merit to get the first exodus in the first place? Because after all, the Gemara says that we were idol worshippers. With the exception of the Levim, the Levi tribe, many of the Israelites at the time were worshipping idols like the Egyptians. To the extent when we came, or arrived at Yam Suf, the angel of the ocean came to Hashem and said, I'm not splitting for them. Why? They're worshipping idols and the Egyptians are worshipping idols. Why should I split for them and kill them? It's not fair. Meaning we're still idol worshippers even after the ten plagues. We only became tzaddikim when we arrived at the Mount Sinai. Got to the highest level of Kedusha. But before then, we weren't exactly tzaddikim. So what gave us the merit? Chachamim say three simple things. One, we kept the same language as we always had, Sfat Kodesh. We didn't adapt ourselves to the scholarly society of English and, and uh, Arabic and uh, this and that. No, no, we stayed Hebrew speakers. We didn't go into the other places we didn't turn Spanish into our first language. We didn't turn English to our first language. We didn't, no, no. In Egypt, we continue speaking Hebrew. Hashem says, I like that. Second, we didn't change our clothes. We still were noticeably Jewish. If a Jew walked down the street, no one mistook him for an Egyptian. He didn't walk around with those funny-looking hats. He didn't walk around with a skirt. He didn't walk around with all types of braces on his arms to look hip like the fellow Egyptian. No. He still was identifiably Jewish. Hashem says, I like that. Third, we kept our names. 
Yehuda was still Yehuda, Yaakov was still Yaakov, Yosef was still Yosef, and we did not start calling ourselves Judah or Judo or Jude. No, no, we stayed. Yehuda was Yehuda. Yosef stayed Yosef. It didn't become Joey. It didn't become Joey. It didn't become. All of the names stayed as they are. Yaakov stayed Yaakov with the Ayn. Yaakov. Not Jacob. Not Kobe. We didn't become a stake. We stayed ja Yaakov. Hashem says, I like that. How much do you like it? He says, those three things gave you a merit for me to take you out of Egypt. Now, what do we look like today? Today, Rabotai, we have Torah, Baruch Hashem. But those merits, not so much. Your average kid grows up in Western society or even Eastern society wanting to be a gangster rapper. Wanting to be, wants, wants to bust some rhymes. He wants to be like 50 cent, not 50, like the number, 50. He wants people to call him by an acronym. Yo, G, top. Yo, that's ill. That's what he wants. He wants to talk like the Goyim. If the Goyim talk like that, it's not advisable. It's not a sin. A Jew does that, Shem says, I don't like that. Not so much. You're not G. And you're not Yo. And you're not a gangster rapper. You're a Jew. That's acting like he's of because you want to talk like them. And your name turned to be like theirs. And instead of being Yaakov, now you're like Kobe, or Dubi, or Didi, or whatever name you come up with. You're not proud of your Jewish name. You have to give yourself an American name. That was a merit that was very valuable at the time before you attacked Mitzrayim. The second thing that we had, clothes. We were identifiably Jewish. Now, although Jews looked very different back then than they do now, the only people that truly identify themselves as Jews are the people that are ethnically Jewish on the exterior, whether it be the Hasidim or it be some of the Sephardi Jews, uh, Yemenites, Moroccans, and so on, that still keep to their tradition where they walk around like who they are. Unfortunately, that's a minority. Because the average Jew that walks around in the world today if it was based on looks, you cannot even tell he's Jewish at all. You cannot tell she's Jewish at all. She looks like she just came from Hollywood. She does, she is, there is no, there's nothing, that's nothing Jewish about her outfit. The Rebbitson of the shul is walking around like she just came out of some magazine from Aesop's world. I've seen it with my own eyes, where there's a re Rebetzin, or whatever you want to call her, in the community that I lived b before, I couldn't believe she was Jewish, needless to say, a Rebetzin. I had to double check, somebody said, no, no, that's the Rebetzin of such and such shul. I said, but where's her clothes? What happened? She, they ran out of money, they need to do a fundraiser. More or less, average Jew today doesn't want to look Jewish. Average Jew today, unless he's glued to the Torah, 
once look like he just came out of a Hollywood movie, like he just came off of the runway. Even if he's religious, he wants to have not the classy suit that's ageless. He wants to have a suit that makes sure that you know how many ribs he has, because it goes like this, and it makes sure that you know how he has, and he makes sure he wants you to know exactly what's the circumference of his thigh and also his shin, because everything is so tight that he wants, because he wants to make sure he looks like Beckham, the, the soccer player that made this fashionable, or maybe Lil Wayne, the guy that, works, that wears girls', uh, girls underwear and girls' uh, jeans and made it fashionable, he wants to look like that. And you know what? He's not going to wear shoes like a respectable human being. He's going to wear his kicks. He's going to wear his sneakers with a suit because he wants to look like uh, Kanye West. He wants to be hip. And he's not going to wear a normal watch to be able to tell the time. He's going to put a clock, a clock that you put on the wall on his hand because he wants to make sure the whole world can tell time even if they're in Iran. They can see his hand. But he's hip and he comes to show. Top, yo, he do it. No vowels. Everything rhymes, though. He speaks in rhymes. He looks like he came out of some magazine. And it's a joke. You see it. You see sometimes Bachure Yeshiva look like that. Needless to say, the secular world. Sometimes in a secular world, you're just proud of them for wearing clothes, period. But the point being is, more or less, the average Jew doesn't so much want to look so Jewish. And even if he's still holding on to Judaism's dear life, you see that it's not exactly he's trying to be different. Like he's actually working hard to be different. Like, he can't just go to the store and just buy any keeper that covers his head. He has to buy the most colorful one that you can see from outer space because it has like neon colors and it's just the right, you know, covers only exactly 27% of the head. And he has to have this thing. Why? Because... Just a regular, old-fashioned black keeper, Rabbi. Come on, man. It's not fashionable anymore. I want it to look cool. And that's what happens. We, little by little, lose the merit of having one of the things that gave us the merit to get saved from Egypt. Because we don't want to dress like Jews. Now, Again, the most important part of dress is to be modest. But that's the problem. With change, the foundation, little by little, is eliminated. And that's why the Chachamim say, anything that's new is forbidden by the Torah. What does that mean? Anything that does not have a foundation that comes from the Torah, whether it be teaching or ruling, surely is forbidden by the Torah. Meaning that if you're going to, let's say, teach Torah in the world, and your way of teaching is not the way that Moshe Rabbeinu taught, it's not the way Hashem taught, it's not the way the prophets taught, it's not the way the sages taught, you're going to find a new way of teaching. Torah says, forbidden. I'm not talking about using tools, whether it be computer or it be a phone or otherwise. No, that's like either using a hammer or a uh, rock. That you can do. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you're teaching Torah from a different angle. You don't want to teach Torah based on the foundational principles, reward and punishment, the Hashem is eternal, Hashem is unlimited. No, you want to say Hashem needs us. Because it makes you feel special. It makes you feel special. You want to say Hashem loves everyone. Because you don't want to remind people that they're probably going to go to Genome. If they continue with doing what they're doing. And you also want them to like you. So you tell them, no, no, nobody gets punished. And you start changing little things that become big things. Torah says, forbidden. Why? 
it does not have a source with Moshe Rabbeinu, surely you are wrong. Surely you are wrong. And that's the thing, Rabbi Although the Jews of Egypt look more like the Arabs of today, the traditional Arabs that wear the gowns-like type of uh, clothing, they didn't look like the Hasidim that wear the strimo. They didn't look like the uh, Wall Street guys. They didn't look like the uh, yeshiva boys with the suit, black and white. They look more like Arabs. But the point being is not necessarily what their clothes were, but rather that they were modest. When you veer away from the foundation of Judaism, which is to be modest in your clothing, modest in your behavior, modest in your thinking, because now you want to be more fashionable, even if you're following, let's say, he has a black and white suit, and you're going to get a black and white, right? But his is going to be the old-fashioned way, normal, he looks like a respectable person, he can be working on Wall Street, or he can be uh, Rosh Hashiva. You can't tell the difference. Why? Because they both wear a suit. But you, because you want to be fashionable, you're going to do something a little bit different. You're going to have your suit, you know, be something that is a little tighter a little less modest, a little bit more provo provocative, a little bit more screamish. And that, little by little, becomes different clothes. All of a sudden, you don't want to wear a white shirt, you want to wear a t-shirt. And all of a sudden, you don't want to wear this, you want to wear that. And, this, and little by little, the foundation that held you close, little by little, starts disintegrating just like a rotting tree. So this is how we start losing our second, our second merit. We not only lost our language, our names, but our clothing too. The average Jew is not using his Hebrew name, and even if they are using their name, many of the names are not from the Torah, they just make all types of names. They call people all types of animals or, or, or winds or all types of strange things. Tell them, why don't you call the kid, I don't know, Moshe or something. Why don't you call him David? Why don't you call him like something like from the Torah? No, no, I want something more uh, fashionable. What are you going to call him? I don't know, I'm going to call him like. Who? Like who? What are you going to call What do you mean? What, what's like? No, I'm going to call him like because I use Facebook a lot, so I figured maybe I'll call him like. And that's what a couple did some years ago. They called their newborn son Like. And all types of other stupid names that people call themselves. There are even Jewish parents that call their kid Nimrod. It's a very common name. They call their son Nimrod. Nimrod is the first enemy of God. But they call him that. It's an awful name. It's like calling your son Hitler. It's no different. But that's how ignorant. That's how ignorant we've become. Now... A person needs to be proud of his Judaism. But you cannot be proud of your Judaism if you don't know Torah. So, this Rabotai is happening as we speak. And we see that Esav is starting to notice Yaakov in the world. This time last year, we were not worried about coronavirus. But many people were petrified much more. They forgot, but they were actually petrified much more than they are today. People forgot last year. People think that we're only scared this year. It's been such a tough year. Last year was much tougher. We were much more scared this time last year. You know why last year? Last year... America was one, one centimeter away from becoming Nazi Germany. All of a sudden, anti-Semitism was all over the streets. They were beating up Jews every day. In New York, in California, in Florida, all of a sudden, for no good reason, some kid picks up a boulder and pah on some Jewish guy's head. And you see countless videos of this. And people are like, oh, it's time for us to leave. Aliyah, let's go. It's time for Amisad to leave here. All of a sudden, all of us want to get out. Then things calmed down by the mercy of Hashem. And then coronavirus came out because we didn't do tshuva. What happened? Anti-Semitism, Rabotai, has increased over 50%. 
in the last year. Right now, American anti-Semitism is the highest it's ever been. It's highest it's ever been. Over 50% of Americans admit to being openly anti-Semitic. You're talking about over 200 million of our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, admit to being anti-Semitic. It is now in mode, in style, to be openly anti-Semitic. Politicians do it, celebrities do it, and in fact, many of them are proud of it. And people think that if they make a bunch of tweets to say, oh, I condemn such and such for seeing his anti-Semitic mar- remarks, like, they think that helps. If anything, it brings more attention to that idiot and you being an idiot for thinking that helps. You think that if you condemn this celebrity for saying anti-Semitic mark, that's going to do anything? It's not a him. It's him. It's not that guy. It's a Kadosh Baruch Hu trying to tell you because you or perhaps your neighbor or perhaps your family or perhaps your community or simply your brothers and sisters as a nation are acting like them so I'm making sure to use them to remind you you're not them and this is what HaKadosh Baruch Hu does time and time again in the Torah as we see in the book of Isaiah chapter 10 verse number 5 Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, Hashem says. My wrath is a staff in their hand against a hypocritical people. Against a hypocritical people, I shall send them. Against the people that angers me, shall I charge them. Akadosh Baruch Hu calls Esav, calls the Goim, his rod. He calls him his rod in order to go against the hypocritical people. Who are the hypocritical people? His kids, the Jewish people. But not to destroy them. As he says, my wrath is a staff in their hand. That although I hit them, I have a sav, remind Am Yisrael that he is Yaakov and not a sav with the anti-Semitic remarks and the anti-Semitic behavior and all types of other things, although I do it, all of that is for the sake of allowing my staff to go in full force by redirecting them. Where is he redirecting us? In last week's parasha, parashat Nitzavim, we learned the secret of what a Kadosh Baruch Hu wants from us. And it says in chapter 30, verse number 2, V'shavta ad Adunai Eloecha, V'shamata Bekolo. It says, and you will return to Hashem your God and listen to His voice. The Ramban, Nechmanadi, says this verse is the mitzvah of doing tshuva. V'shavta means you return. But if you notice, Vishafta has Shafta is to return, but also has the same letters as Shabbat. Because Tshuva starts with Shabbat. If you don't keep Shabbat, your Tshuva hasn't started. Yeah, but I keep kosher. Okay, so they'll feed you kosher food in the department over there that doesn't keep Shabbat. Why? Without Shabbat, there's no Judaism. But most importantly, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says you can do tshuva no matter where you are today. You could be a criminal spiritually or criminal in any other way. You can return to Hashem by first off stopping your misbehavior. Stop acting like Esav. Stop wanting to be like Esav. Stop thinking like them. Be like Yaakov. What does Yaakov do? He learns Torah and he puts his effort into the Torah as much as he does to business. You're allowed to work, but you also have to learn Torah. One cannot be a replacement of the other. So last week, HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us that you have to fulfill this mitzvah of tshuva, return to Hashem and listen to His voice, listen to His 
all of his mitzvot, and then for all of those people that think that perhaps the Torah is too difficult, I didn't grow up religious, I didn't have the same father as Rav Kanievsky, my father is not Moshe Rabbeinu, I don't know how to do this, and I don't know how to do that. Moshe Rabbeinu tells us the words of Hashem. In verse number 11, he says, For this commandment that I command you today, it's not hidden from you, it's not distant, it's not in the heaven for you to say, who can ascend to the heaven for us and take it for us so we can listen to it. Nor is it in the sea for you to say, who can cross to the other side of the sea for us to take it for us, so that we can listen to it and perform it. Rather, it's a matter that is very near to you. It's in your mouth, it's in your heart to perform it. Do not say that the Torah is too difficult, that the mitzvot are too difficult. It's wrong. You're a liar. It's not, the Torah is not difficult. The mitzvot are not difficult. You don't want to do it. Not that you don't want to do it, doesn't make it, that, that was what makes it difficult. Why? It's in your mouth, it's in your heart to do it, to perform it. Meaning, you were created with a technology that makes you a perfect, a perfect vehicle to fulfill the entire Torah. Just like if you take a certain computer and you program that computer to tell this machine, to tell these four wheels, to tell this vehicle to act like a vacuum cleaner. Guess what? That piece of plastic combined with those pieces of metals with the microprocessor technology that's telling them what to do is going to make that vacuum the best vacuum you could possibly get. Why? Because that's what it was programmed to do. Now if you tell that vacuum to be a dog, it's not going to work out so well for you. If you tell that vacuum to, to be maybe a car, probably not going to survive a day or two. Why? It's too small. If you tell that vacuum to do anything but be a vacuum, it's not going to work out. Why? It was designed to be a vacuum. Yaakov, Am Israel, guess what? You're the best Yaakov that could be. You're the best person that could fulfill the entire Torah that exists in the world today. Why? Because that's what you created to do. The only reason why the Torah is difficult is not because the Torah is difficult and it's not because you can't understand it. And it's not because you are not smart enough. It's not because you have a certain upbringing. No. The Torah is a perfect fit for you no matter where you started. Why is it difficult? Because you don't want to do it. Why don't you want to do it? You're addicted to certain desires that negate the Torah. The Torah says, don't look at a woman that's not your wife. You love looking, especially at women that are not your wives. The Torah says, only eat kosher. You love a nice bacon, egg, and cheese, especially in the morning. That's a problem. Torah says you have to be honest in business. Your whole business is built on lies. The Torah says you have to do a certain amount of things every single day and you don't like anybody telling you what to do. So it's not that the Torah is difficult. It's that you have built yourself for life with certain desires that run your life that make you detest the Torah. And that's why HaKadosh Baruch Hu continues in saying, Rei natati lachem, natati lefanecha ayom et hachayim ve'et hatov, ve'et hamavet ve'et hara. See, I have placed before you today the life and the good, the death and the evil. HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us clearly, life and good, that's observing the Torah. Death and evil, that's going against the Torah. And he clearly tells us, you should choose life. Like, you can't choose death. 
You can choose evil because there is free choice. But it's not so free. There's a price to it. Death is evil and there's a price for that. Good in life is a reward for that. And for anyone that thinks that maybe something changed, verse 19 in chapter 30 tells us clearly what a, how Hashem thinks in this regard. And He says, I call the heaven and the earth today to bear witness against you. I have placed life and death before you, blessing and curse, and you shall choose life so that you will live you and your offspring, to love Hashem your God, to listen to His voice, and to cleave to Him. For He is your life, and the length of your days to dwell upon the land that Hashem swore to your forefathers, to Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, to give them. HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us, listen, you have a choice to make. You can do evil, but that's going to bring you death. You can do good. And that's going to bring you life. You have the ability to choose. But if you want the blessings, you have to choose the thing that it connects to blessings. You have to stop acting like those that go against me. Finally, Rav Wasserman says, Such is the advice which has been given to us as to what there is for us to do in these difficult times. The solution is for all time to be rock-like in our emunah and not submit to our environment. Yet we may ask, how can we possibly do this in our exceptional position? To this the answer is given in the prophet Isaiah chapter 43 verse 2. I am the wall. This, says the rabbis, the, the sages, refers to the Torah. Only the Torah has the power to stabilize us, to make us firm as iron. The history of Am Yisrael during thousands of years bears true witness to the fact that girded with Torah, we have not perished, that we have been through fire and water. And as the verse Goes in Isaiah 43 2. When you go across water, I am with you. When you walk across the fire, you shall not be singed, and the flame shall not burn you. Akadosh Baruch Hu promises us. He puts his name, he swears on his name in his Torah. If we're glued to him, if we cleave to him, even fire can't burn us, even water can't drown us. And that's what Rav Wasserman says. Yes, we've gone through difficulties, but that in essence was in our own hands. We force Hashem, we force Hashem to slap us. Why? We don't want to listen to Him. We force Hashem to hit us with the rod. Why? We don't want to listen to Him. And Rav Wasserman says, yeah, you may say that the times are now really difficult. Anti-Semitism is very high. The next politician may as well be Hitler. The situation that's happening even among us, Jew versus Jew, instead of Jew for Jew. There's more hatred among ourselves than there is even from the Goyim against us. Your conquerors, your destroyers will come from within you. I heard one Talmud Chachana say that there's more anti-Semitism inside Israel than there is outside of Israel. By other Jews. Right now, there is a enormous amount of anti-Semitism happening in Israel, specifically against religious Jews. By the lefty liberal Jewish people that have no idea what the Torah is, and you're literally seeing them doing all types of things and with the government and the rules and so on to dafka go against the religious people. Now this, of course, is not going to help the non-religious people's world, but it's also a rebuke on the religious people. 
Because the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says that the only reason why the secular people remain secular is because the religious people don't rebuke them. The religious people don't care enough about the non-religious people. Most of the money that people spend their tzedakah money on is to fund their own interest, which is to fund their own yeshiva, to fund their own religious community. Very little amount of money goes towards helping our brothers and sisters that are not exactly religious right now. You see, some of the biggest philanthropists, some of the people that donate the most amount of money inside the Jewish world, they'll donate two, three, four, five million dollars to a yeshiva, or two, three, four hundred thousand dollars to a yeshiva. Right? And then you'll see who else they donate to. Oh, to yeshiva. Oh, it's all good. You have to donate for the Torah. You have to. Without them, we're not going to survive. But what is the problem? What is the problem? The problem is that the yeshiva world, the Torah world, is not enough. Why? It's only about 20% of the entire nation. The other 80% is excluded from the yeshiva world. They're not there. So, yeah, you want to donate a million dollars to yeshiva? You should. But you should donate a million dollars also to Kiruv to help those people that are not in yeshiva come to the yeshiva. Maybe if you donate enough money towards Kiruv, there's going to be enough people that come from the secular world to the yeshiva world that the prices of yeshiva will become actually more affordable. Because what's happened today is that it's so expensive to go to yeshiva that sometimes even religious people, more or less, end up sending their kids either to, to, to a school at home or perhaps to a public school because they can't afford sending them to a yeshiva. And that's not even talking about all of the racism and garbage that happens in yeshivot that simply hate everybody that doesn't look or act like them. Every week I get new stories. Oh, my boy wasn't accepting yeshiva. My girl wasn't accepting in the seminary. Why? Because she's Ashkenazi. Because she's Faradi. Because she's this. Because she's a convert. Because we're Baal Tshuva. Everybody all of a sudden is very selective with their students. You know who else was selective? Mr. Rosh Yeshiva. You know, if you're, if you're a Rosh Yeshiva and you're about to reject a kid because he's Faradi, if you're a Rosh Yeshiva and you're about to reject a kid that was a Shke, because he's Ashkenazi, if you're a head of a seminary and you're about to reject a girl because she's a convert or because they, uh, her mom's a convert or because they're Baalet Shuva or because they're Sfaradi or because they're Ashkenazi, if you're about to reject someone, I'm just letting you know. I'm not God, I'm not even nothing. But I'm just letting you, there is a rule in the world, it's called measure for measure. Okay? You know, HaKadosh Baruch Hu showed us what being selective looks like. You're being selective. HaKadosh Baruch Hu showed us 80 years ago who else was selective. And it wasn't the Jews. It was the Nazis. They were selective. I promise you, anybody that doesn't accept a kid just because they're Sfaradi, Shkanazi, or some other racial nonsense, or because he's black, or because he's burgundy, not because he's Jewish. That's not enough for them. They're rejecting them because he doesn't look like them. She doesn't look like them, I promise you. When Gogo Magog happens, you're the first one HaKadosh Baruch Hu's going to take. Why? Because you are selective against your own people. You destroyed that girl's life. You destroyed that boy's life when you rejected them. Why? He wanted to go to that school because all of his friends go there. She wanted to go to that seminary because that's the best seminary in town. But you didn't let her. Why? Because she doesn't look like you. And guess what? Nazis don't look like you either. They're going to remind you of that too. I'm hoping that scares you enough to stop. Stop with the nonsense. Because every week I get more of these garbage stories of how people are racist. Within ourselves, the most persecuted nation in the history of mankind is racist against itself. How stupid can we be? It's, it's mamas, unbelievable how dumb we can be. But that's what's happening. Why? We are not following what the Torah says. We're following what our pocket says, what our bank teller says, what society says, and that's the problem. 
That's the problem, Rabotai. Rav Wasserman says the only cure for this spiritual cancer is to go and glue ourselves to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to His Torah, and to His sages. Don't bring anything new to the table. There is no value whatsoever in anything new that you're bringing that does not have a lineage connecting it to Mount Sinai. If it's new, but connected to Mount Sinai, no problem. But if it's new, without connection, it's forbidden. It's going to get you in trouble, and it's getting all of us in trouble. Enough. Enough. Look what's happening. People are so far removed from where the source is, they forgot the source even exists. You have all types of weird laws and weird things people are saying every single day. And I'm telling you, it's very hard for a secular person to come into this religious world. And I'll tell you this honestly. I told this to my rabbi and he says, you're right. If I didn't learn to lie and I didn't go through hell and all that stuff, if I was still a secular person, and I looked at the religious world, today, I wouldn't want to be religious. Why? It's gross. It's outright gross. The way people hate each other, just because his tradition is different, just because his ideology is slightly different, but he's still a Jew, and he's still observant, and everything is okay, but he hates him just because of that. The way people hate each other and how they're racist against each other is gross. Now, it's okay to disagree. Obviously, I disagree with a lot of different people that are against the Torah, but I'm not talking about people that are against the Torah. There are people that are for the Torah. They're observing the Torah, but they have a different mindset than you do. The amount of hatred that people have for that is just beyond bizarre because that's not a Jewish thing. That's a sav. That's Amalek. We're not supposed to be that way. Bet Shammai and Bet Hillel fought over the truth day and night. But guess what? They still married each other's kids. Because they were fighting for the truth. They weren't fighting each other. Today we're fighting each other. Just because I make some videos about heretics and expose them, all of a sudden the fact that I'm Sephardi matters to people. All of a sudden, the fact that I'm not part of Chabad matters to people. All of a sudden, the fact that I'm a Baal Tshuva matters to people. All of a sudden, everybody has their opinion of what my career would look like, even though they wouldn't survive a single day in my shoes. Not today or back then. All of a sudden, everybody knows what my bank account looks like. All of a sudden, has their opinions to say about what they think my kids' life are like. Why? Because I said something you don't like. And guess what? I'm just like everybody else. Just like everybody else. Public personality, perhaps. But just like everybody else. But no. In their eyes, no. Now, since you're against my hero, you're a dirty Sephardi. With a lot of other nice compliments. Oh, just like because you're, you're not a Chabadnik? No, no. We are rejecting your transaction. We're, not gonna, we, we're out of stock. What do you mean you're out of stock? You're out of stock a month before Sukkot? You ran out of stock a month out of Sukkot? Okay, so you're just canceling the things you're out of stock. No, we're out of stock of everything. This is what's happening today. This is the type of garbage that's happening. And I'm not the only one. I'm talking to you about stories that I have, stories that other people have. My uh, stories that I hear from people are much worse. Why? We're not using our Torah as the foundation to our life. Instead, we're using things we le learned from the Goim. We admire the Goyim. We dress like them. We look like them. We want to be like them. And that's the problem. If you're not walking around being the most proud Jewish person the world has ever seen, that means there's a little bit of lacking of Torah in you. The more you want to be like a Goy, the more Torah you're missing in your life. You should be the most proud Jew in the world. If you're embarrassed from wearing a kippah that covers your head, there's a little bit of Torah missing. If you're embarrassed of looking modest, there's Torah missing. If you're embarrassed to let people know that starting Friday night, you can't talk to them, you can't do anything business until Motzei Shabbat and preferably until Sunday, you're embarrassed to let people know about that because you think maybe they'll call you a vampire or something, you're, you're missing a little bit of Torah.
and I'm being sarcastic with a little bit. If you're not proud of the mitzvot, if you're not proud of being the oldest civilization in the world, if you're not proud of being part of the civilization that brought more good to the world than the rest of society combined from the beginning of the world until the end, if you're not proud of being part of the chosen people by acting like the chosen people, you're missing Torah. If you want admire some blogger or YouTuber or politician, instead of admiring Moshe Rabbeinu and Rabbi Akiva, you're missing Torah. If your hero is some basketball or football player, you're missing Torah. If you're not taking advantage of every single minute that you have, that you don't need to work and you don't need to sleep and you don't need to go to the bathroom, but you have that time and you're not utilizing that time to learn more Torah, to learn more about Hashem, to learn more about your brothers and sisters, to learn more about the purpose of the world, the purpose of your life. If you're not looking for that opportunity to learn more Torah, you're missing Torah. You're missing the point. And the problem is, Rabotai, is that if you don't wake yourself up, no one's going to do it for you. You can live your whole life living a mistake and not even know it until it's too late. You wake up one day, 70, 75 years old, and you realize your whole life is meaningless. Even after you got the car and the house and the wife and the kids, and it's all meaningless. Why? It's all temporary. It's all not you. Because you are about to leave the world. And you can't take any of them with you. This is Rabotai. It's one of the most important things that a person needs to think about. How proud am I of being a Jew? Not by, oh, I'm arrogant because I'm a Jew. You being born to a Jewish mother or converting doesn't make you special. What makes you special is following the Torah. You don't follow the Torah, not only are you not special, you're worse than everybody else. Because at least they're acting the way they're supposed to. Now, Wasserman says that although the shepherds are there to blame for being super very very much a big part of the reason of why Am Yisrael did not do tshuva, that's not an excuse that's going to help us at the time of Mashiach. That's not an excuse that's going to help us at the time of Gogu Magog. That's not an excuse that's going to help us at the time of trouble. The only thing that's going to help us is us waking up ourselves and each other. By learning more Torah, learning more Musar, applying it to our life, making ourselves more holy, improving ourselves, and being very, very proud of it every day. Look for a way to be more Jewish every day. And if you're Noahide, look for a way to be a more righteous Noahide every day. And if you're Esav, look for a way to stop being Esav, because it's not good for you. It's not good for you. Bezat Hashem, this gives, gives us enough chizuk to do a little bit more tshuva. Tomorrow night we have our last lecture of the year. Bezat Hashem, it's going to be questions and answers. And then we have Rosh Hashanah Bezat Hashem. And then we'll have a, uh, one or two lectures next week Bezat Hashem. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen Amen. Baruch Hashem, we've completed another year at Bezat Hashem. Rabbi Ephraim and I are very proud to announce some major milestones that we've achieved, Bezat Hashem, and with your help, our dear partners. Over 60 million minutes of our Torah has been watched over the last year. That's a million hours of Torah to help people do tshuva and get closer to Hashem. Over 300,000 CDs have been distributed around the world for free. We've also made over 1,000 lectures between the two of us, as well as also with Rav Chaim being added to the roster. Over 60,000 
regular viewers are watching our tour right now across the board. Over 200,000 answers regarding halacha, family, shlom bayit, different topics on a regular basis being uh, given to people. Over 10,000 people have been helped, whether it's through food or different uh, financial issues. A thousand families of Torah scholars are being helped by Irgun Be'ezot Hashem. We've published and distributed over 5,000 halachic books, kuntresses, uh, newsletters, musar books around the world. We are also currently helping over 130 families complete their conversion to Orthodox Judaism. Our TV channel continues to grow, our YouTube channel, our Facebook pages, our WhatsApp pages, everything continues to grow, Baruch Hashem. Thanks to Hashem and thanks to our dear partners. Be'ezot Hashem, much more next year. B'Shem Hashem Nasev and Atzliach, we're very excited to offer you the new Be'ezot Hashem app 3.0. It's a newer, faster app, full of Torah, lots of Kedusha by uh, the Shurim that we do, myself, Rav Ephraim, Rav Chaim, uh, where you'll have uh, also newer features where you're able to use the app uh, while you're using other applications on your phone. You'll be able to share the, uh, the lectures directly from the app. You'll be able to donate online and support our Cube and our Torah work that we're doing. And the most exciting feature is that you'll be able to actually ask questions directly on the app and get answers from the rabbis directly from the app. This is something unprecedented, and Baruch Hashem will be able to offer it. Thank you again for all of your support. Check it out. Make sure you have the kosher Torah that uh, will re-energize your neshama each and every single day. Call to B'chavat